if we're nervous, the body is telling the brain, oh my God, you're in danger. And what makes us nervous going into an audition because they may say we don't, you know, no thanks, but no thanks, you're not right for the part. In caveman days, you're being dejected. You're being rejected from that group. That's what the primitive brain is picking up. Oh, I just got rejected. Oh no, I'm gonna go out there, be alone and get eaten by a tiger. You're listening to Inside Acting, a podcast dedicated to demystifying the inner and outer game of success in the entertainment industry. I'm Trevor Algott. And I'm AJ Meyer. And episode 250 is a very exciting episode that we have been working on. We've had this in the works for quite some time now. Uh, We're bringing back one of our most beloved guests in recent memory, Stephen Rohr. And Steve's episodes still, to this day, receive great responses on social media for his paradigm-shifting comments on an actor's inner game while pursuing a career in the entertainment industry. But this time, he's brought along his super-intelligent and super-talented friend, Dr. Shirley Impelizari, to discuss the book they've co-authored together entitled Scared Speechless, Nine Ways to Overcome Your Fear and Captivate Your Audience. The book itself is is focused on public speaking, but it's the application to acting. Its applications to acting are are vast and deep, and that's exactly why we wanted to bring them on the show. If you've ever wanted to harness the power of your own psychology as an actor to support you in the audition room, on set, on the red carpet, then this two-parter is a must-listen. Support for this episode of Inside Acting comes from Rehearsal Pro, the next version of Rehearsal, the essential app for actors. It's now available in the iTunes App Store. So if you want to learn your lines, if you want to get off book quickly for your auditions, explore your character, make stronger choices, and really walk into the room with confidence and book the office, uh, go to rehearsal.pro slash IAP right now to learn all about the great new features in this newest version of Rehearsal, the groundbreaking app designed by actors for actors that is rehearsal pro and you can get it right now for your ios device at rehearsal.pro slash iap hey everyone 250 man i feel like I feel like that's a milestone episode, and we didn't, other than our awesome guests, we didn't do anything necessarily special <laughs> for this one. Yeah, I, I love the way you you positioned it, though, in the intro there. You said, uh, if you've ever wanted to harness the power of your own psychology as an actor to support to support you in the audition room, on set, or on the red carpet, this all this uh, this two parter is a must listen. I mean, damn, dude, I'm I'm sold. Yeah. So it looks like you had another taping for Blacklist. Uh, and Another it, and and also uh, a meeting for the theater of Arizona. Is this right? I mean, stuff's going on for you, man. What's what's up here? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, it was funny because uh, Ben has Ben White Air has been our ghost host with the most has been so generous in in supporting me and helping me get uh, you know a lot of my on tape auditions on tape and sent off. And uh, it's just become so. It's almost like a, a well-oiled machine. It's been it's become so um, practiced that when we're done shooting, we drop the content onto his computer, and I end up using his computer with iMovie and and whatever, and I do the uploading from his computer. So that it's just done before I even leave his house. And the reason I wanted to talk about it, uh, the fact that I was going in for blacklist again, is because I went to save the file. And it was like blacklist and then the number of the episode. And I looked and the last time that I was at his house putting something on tape, it was blacklist and the episode number before. So, wow, they're they're working to find a, a role for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I talked about this, uh, whatever, a couple episodes back or whatever it was. And, you know, it's just it, it is one of those things. You get in good with an office and they're just going to keep bringing you in for anything. I wasn't even on paper. I wasn't even really right for this for this role because it was for. 
uh, an ethnicity that I, I don't look like at all. So it would have taken the producers being open um, to another, a different ethnicity, filling the, the role and yada, yada, yada. So anyway, um, it, uh, it, it was just a really cool experience when I hit save on that file and it was like, you know, four Oh whatever. And then four Oh thing, the one before it. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, and then the, the meeting for, uh, theater of Arizona, they're doing an act of God, which was, uh, on Broadway and, um, Jim Parsons made the role originally the role on Broadway of, of God. And it's like this 90 minute or so, um, comedy where, an actor of some fame embodies the role of God. Um, so first it was Jim Parsons, then Sean Hayes took over, and then he ended up doing it here in Los Angeles at the Amundsen. Yeah, yeah, um, recently. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, went in for that today. Kind of interesting because the director is currently in New York, I think. And so it was in a theater. The audition, the, the casting director actually got himself a theater to, to hold the auditions in. But it was on tape for the director who's in New York. So okay. it was like, you know, a the, so anyway, the casting director came out beforehand and said, you know, even though it's on tape, like, don't fall in love with the size of the room and, 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 and think you're just on camera. Like, this is, this is a, a theater audition, so make sure that you take that into account. So um, that's, always inter- that's always an interesting sort of uh, balance. So, so you went to a theater here in Los Angeles to be taped for this audition? Right. For this meeting. I've had both experiences. One where the room was super tiny. It was like, a, you know, a little casting director's office and it was just her, me and the camera. And I, I told this story, but just as a reminder, she was like complimenting me on my ability to take into account both the fact that it was an audition for theater, but I was p- being put on camera. Mm. So the balance. Mm. And then today... Uh, he kind of instructed us just to ignore the camera altogether. So I did. I just, I looked at, uh, you know, him because he was the one I was delivering my lines to the entire time and just kind of forgot that the camera was there except for my slate. Cool. How, how do you feel about it? I thought it went well. I thought it went well. It's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, we've talked about on the podcast before always to have like other things going on in your life. So if you don't book something, right. it's no big deal. Um, it would conflict with, um, I don't even think I've talked about this. I, I joined the understudy cast uh, at uh, uh, Theater Boston Court. Yeah, you, you, to- you told me, but we haven't talked about it on the show. Yeah, yeah. They, um, I auditioned for it originally. I put no that I wasn't available to be an understudy because I've done that at that theater already. Um, but they were, they were um, up a creek a little bit. They, I think they lost one of their actors. They reached out to me again and just said, hey, are you interested? We lost an actor. And I, and I accepted this sort of invite, if you will, to join the understudy cast. Anyway, it would conflict with that as well as a family vacation I have uh, planned coming up in the next um, like month. So it's, it's, it's one of those things as an actor, I have other things going on in my life. And if I don't book this, I'm like, eh, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, sweet. I'll have to change all my shit around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> sweet. I don't have to change all my shit around. I'm going to, I'm going to, can I write that down? Can I quote you on that? Trevor? Yes, absolutely. Let's put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> Sweet, I don't have to change all my shit around. <laughs> uh, yes, the next version of the uh, IAP t-shirts. That's hilarious. Um, but I'm really excited to talk about um, some news that you have uh, from this week uh, that you know I don't think is going to be as big of a, a sort of a game changer uh, as you do. But I know you had some concerns and wanted to sort of address it on the podcast. But uh, tell the folks at home what uh, what we're talking about. Sure. So. Hmm. I, um, when I first got to LA about two years or so into my, my sort of residency here, uh, I signed with a great theatrical agent and, uh, good guy. We're friends. Uh, we share a lot of the same interests. He's worked really hard for me and we've, we've done a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of, you know, great stuff done together. Um, however, I, as I'm getting older, I, I'm changing as a, as a person and I, I have this this memory today that sort of swam to the surface of my consciousness as I was on my way to the Valley to do this thing that I'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> it was of my grandmother, uh, one holiday when I was, oh, I think I was, when I said, when I say childhood, I, I wasn't really a child. I was about 20 or 21. Uh, and I was at, a, you know, I was back in Philly. Uh, I had been in LA for a, a, maybe a year, I think. And, uh, and my grandmother said, you know, well, like w- w- what's your backup plan? And I was like, 
man, I ain't got no backup plan. Like, I ain't, homie, don't play that. Like, I am in this, like, 100%. Like, it's happening. And she said, well, what happens if you change your mind or if you change as a person? And, you know, you want to have something else, you know, lined up. And I was like, come on. Not happening. Um, but I'm... You know, my mid thirties now, and uh, and the the truth of the matter is that I I am changed as a person. My interests are far more diverse than they were fifteen years ago, and um, and I, I the the fire that sort of used to keep the the pot boiling for my acting uh, is is has not really um, it's not nearly the same. I still love acting, and I'll still happily you know like do. Got jobs for anybody who wants to hire me <laughs> and, and I'll enjoy it, you know, but like the other 99% of it doesn't, uh, isn't something that I want to put my energy or time into anymore. It's not like a hell yes. It's not a win for me. Mm. Um, and so I've got, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in music and voiceover. I'm doing a lot more work in both of those realms. Um, uh, and I, you know, the environmental stuff is, is very much a, a passion and an interest of mine. And so the less time I'm putting towards a thing that I don't feel incredibly passionate about, the more time I'll have to put towards things that I do feel incredibly passionate about. So yeah. I drove to the Valley today and I, I basically dropped in at my agent's office and I said, uh, I, I'm going to put a pause on my, my acting career for the time being. I, I don't know if that'll be six months or 10 years or for the rest of my life. I, I don't know, but, um, that was sort of the, the big news is that, uh, I'm not going to be actively pursuing that for some time. Uh, I still consider myself in the industry cause I, I still am very much invested in, in voiceover and, and music is something that I want to explore on a lot of different levels, uh, in the entertainment industry and beyond. But the big thing is acting, and I, I, I was sort of hesitant to air it on the show because I was like, man, are, are people going to like, like who, what business do I have to host a podcast about the entertainment industry if I'm not really actively pursuing acting anymore, if I'm not in the trenches with people on, in that way? And so I, I was, um, I've, I've sort of been tussling with this idea for a little while now. And, uh, just, you know, like you encouraged me before we started recording to just be transparent with it, just like bring it up and, and share it. And a, a reason that I, I'm, I'm more inclined to, to sort of air it. One of the reasons is now that I'm talking, there's really not a good reason to not share this. <laughs> um, but one of the big reasons is I, I also want to like, since my interests are more diverse, I want to have more diverse guests and content on the podcast. And like this conversation, we have this episode with Dr. Uh, with Steve, Steve Rohr and, and Dr. Shirley is is great it's it's like into the psychology of things but i want to talk to environmentalists and activists and i want to talk to musicians and i want to talk to you know self-published writers and i really want to like you know examine a lot of different cultural um aspects of what makes up a person in our in our day and age and it all it always ties back to acting because it's always you know examining the human creature from as many different sort of vantage points as possible um, and I think that this sort of shift or pause on my acting career will actually help support the diversity of, of the conversations that, that we'll have, uh, both with guests and with each other and with our, our listeners. So that's uh, all I have to say about that. Uh, well, I have some things to say and some questions. Um, I, I'm curious, one of the things I want to ask you is just what you feel like a pause means because I noticed that it's different from a, like, I'm not going to do this anymore, or, you know, I'm not right. going to, you know, what, what, in your mind, in your sort of instinct, what do you feel like the word pause means? Uh, great question. Thank you for that, because it's forcing me to get more clear on this. Uh, mm. I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I, I love acting. I think I'm always going to have that in my heart and I'm always going to enjoy it. And every once in a while, you know, the rapid reels guys call and ask me to do a scene. And every once in a while, a friend writes a thing and they're like, Hey, you know, come be in this short film or something. And I love it. And I always have a blast. Um, and I, and knowing myself, I'm smart enough and and mature enough in my mid thirties now to understand that uh, I am not going to be the same person a year from now or six months from now even that I am right mm. now. So I, I don't know what 
I'll take an interest in or what will sort of light a fire for me or, or what it is. Cause I, I'm an intensely, probably to a fault, an intensely curious person. And, and I'm always sort of surprised by what inspires me and, and takes me down, um, certain avenues. I, I'm working on getting more clear on that because, you know, scattered focus equals scattered results. Don't want to be that guy. So, uh, I, I say put a pause on it because I'm not going to, I'm more just like I'm taking my foot off the gas pedal. Um, and I'm, I'm freeing up the mental energy that was tied up the part of my brain that was like basically waiting for, uh, you know, audition notices from my commercial and theatrical reps, that part of my brain that was like, okay, how am I going to handle this? If this comes up, you know, like that's always, it's always been there. It's like the part of your brain that's listening for loud noises in the environment, you know, mm. that we, we don't, we're not really conscious of it, but there's a part of our brain that's always scanning our surroundings for threats and things like that. So it's like, if I can just free up that, that little bit of real estate, I can invest it more towards these, these other things. And, and also, you know, I've been doing the same thing for, for over a decade and I, I want to try some different things in my life. Mm. And, uh, mm, yeah, I think that this was something that I, I really thought long and hard about. And I thought, I think it's time to try something new. And if I change my mind in three months and, and Carl's like, sorry, I, I can't take you. My, my roster's full or whatever. There's a lot of Asians out there. You know, I'm not, I'm not, um, <laughs> I'm not concerned about trying to find new representation if it comes down hmm. to that. I love the idea of like, I'm, I'm mature enough. I can't remember exactly how you said it, but it was something like I'm mature enough now to know that I'm probably not going to be the same person even in six months to a year from now. Um, you know, and that you may go, you may go back to it. And, and the other thing that just came to mind too, hearing you talk about it was, uh, I can almost guarantee you the floodgates are going to open up right now because that always happens. And it always happens. We stop thinking about something or we put it away. We stop worrying about it or we, or we, you know, release some kind of block or whatever. All of a sudden the floodgates open, whether that's going to be in like monetary abundance or your music or, or even acting. Like all of a sudden, like boom, one thing, one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, um, boom, 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 boom. You know, and it's like, oh, I, you know, I said pause, but I also said, <laughs> I also said that if you know someone offered me a job or whatever, I wouldn't turn it down. So I, yeah, I guess okay, I'll go. Like, right, right, right. I know how to do this. I have this skill set. You know, <laughs> it, it would be like if somebody was like, hey, come swim for us. You're yeah. Like, yeah. All right. Cool. I know how to do that thing. Like that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, they say, uh, they, I don't know who they are, but the same, I've heard it said that, you know, if you want to scare up new business or new income or, or new relationships, clean out your closet. Like it's just, it's an energetic principle in the universe that I think most oh, of literally, us literally clean out your closet. Yeah, like, literally like go through and like throw out all your old outfits and all the old crap that you haven't touched in a year, you know, or, or even thought about since you moved last time, you know, just get rid of that stuff. And, it, and something about creating that, that physical space creates a sort of mental and spiritual space in Energetic. the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it, I mean, I can't explain it. I know our, our Western culture kind of shuns these ideas sometimes, but dude, that stuff is totally true. And I think that was a big part of my, my choice to actually drive over there today and, and sort of, just, you know, make this, uh, intention real with, with my, uh, with my agent, because I, I sense that, you know, like, if I can just free up that space, if I can just clean out that part of my, my brain closet, mm. there's, there's room for new space. You know, there's, there's new, new things can come in. Yes. Um, so, and I, you know, I, like I do know that, um, there's a lot of other things in life that I want to do besides acting. And, uh, and this just felt like the right thing right now. Yeah. There, you know, it, 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 I have so many things I want to talk about here about how you're handling this and like the maturity with which you're handling it, the, the emotional intelligence with, with which, with which you're handling it. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is there was this article that was going around Facebook a while back and I, and I actually got into like, not an argument, but a discussion on Facebook with some of the people who sort of agreed with the article and there's some, some people who didn't agree with it. Um, and it was this uh, woman who was, was, quitting acting and that was like the headline of the thing and it was a blog post that she posted about how like she was just done she was stepping away from it but the majority of the not the majority of the post but a lot of the post had there was a lot of any awful club stuff in there mm. you know so like a bitter and, jaded actor yeah and yeah. you know there's something to be said for like someone knowing themselves and knowing that something wasn't making them happy anymore and i totally get that and i think that could be you know what you're doing as well but it's the way you go about it and the, uh, like I said, the maturity with which you're going about it 
that it's a conscious choice to elect other things over this as opposed to like just lighting it on fire and walking away. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's like yeah. mixing metaphors and no, that was a cool. That, that was himself. a funny visual. <laughs> It was, it was, it was very like, that's how it would, that was my experience of reading that article. And, you know, maybe uh, I think I got some feedback from, uh, I think it was Jasmine who was like, look, you, you're, you're, you're a few steps away from being a certified life coach. Like you're going to you're going to read between the lines and see things that other people don't see. So that's probably where that's coming from. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it just felt so much like, yeah, let's like, let's uh, throw a grenade, uh, in this entertainment industry barrel and, and peace out. Um, and it doesn't seem like that's what you're doing. Um, and then as far as the podcast goes, the only thing I want to say about that is, is what you're talking about has already been happening over years, not recently, years. Like we have, we've realized that there's so much that depends upon an actor's inner game and, you know, how they handle themselves and, 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 and the, uh, thoughts and stories and interpretations with which we carry around with us every single day that the the whole th- i mean our our t- intro tagline changed to the inner and outer game of the entertainment industry the the you know so much of the podcast has like developed and evolved and grown to where we're we're already bringing on people that have uh, very little quote unquote very little to do right with the entertainment industry but then then they also have everything to do with it because as you said, it's just about portraying human beings Yeah. and at the end of the day. So <clears throat> I don't know for my money, you don't have to worry about me. Uh, I, I would be curious to see what our listeners have to say. Um, you know, whether it's like a, a rallying cry of en- encouragement and, 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 um, support in terms of what we, uh, what it could potentially grow into or, you know, some people being trepidatious, about it but either way it doesn't matter like bring it on like we're all you know we always talk we're very open and and vulnerable and transparent and um but you know personally i'm i'm excited cool that's that's really good to hear and i i do want to start a a conversation about this in the membership because i'm really excited to be completely honest i mean (laughs) i i don't feel much differently like now than i did before i had i had the uh the meeting with my agent and he was awesome by the way he's such a wise person and i'm really excited for like the the other the for the possibilities you know like i'm just excited for the possibilities um and uh, I and and honing in on that clarity that that uh, that that I feel enables me to be my highest self in the world and and in turn be of the greatest service that I could be because that's kind of what it comes down to for me is that, like I really want to feel like I'm doing something good in the world yeah and uh, the closer I get to like culling some of the the fat cutting the fat from some of my from my life for certain things that maybe I'm not getting the highest payoff from the the more I feel like oh I. I could actually live day to day feeling like I am in significant contribution to, to the evolution of the human species. That's a good feeling. And it's not to say that when I was pursuing acting wholeheartedly that I wasn't doing that. That's sort of the idea there is to, is to move as friction free as possible through life and, and really mm. um, leverage my strengths and, and natural talents and, and gifts and, and things to, to, to do something good, you know? Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm inspired, man. I'm inspired. I'm excited for you. I'm glad you're excited. Um, I'm excited for you. And um, yeah, I can't. I can't wait. It's gonna be. It's gonna be uh, just an awesome addition to your journey and our journey, not as opposed to a subtraction. Let's roll into the interview, and before we do that, of course, we've got to hear from our sponsor. This episode of Inside Acting is brought to you by one of those sponsors, VO2GoGo.com, the award-winning voiceover training system and winner of Backstage's Reader's Choice Award for Best VO Training four years in a row. Visit VO2GoGo.com slash start for a free getting started in voiceover online class that will help you add voiceover to your acting portfolio. That's VO, the number two, gogo.com slash start. 
All right, guys. Well, here is part one of our chat with uh, Steve Rohr, a publicist to the Oscars and many, many more, and Dr. Shirley in Pelizzeri, who is a brilliant, brilliant, as you'll hear, uh, psychologist. So enjoy, and we'll catch you on the other side. interview portion of this episode trevor and i are so excited to be on a four-way skype chat this is the first time we've done this so we'll see how this goes technology wise with one of our most popular recent guests steve Rohr, and his writing partner dr shirley impelizari and these two have written an awesome book uh called scared speechless which is all about public speaking but With the popularity of Steve's interview combined with the application of this book to acting, uh, being a creative, uh, as Steve said just before we started recording, even working a party, there's so many different applications to what we do as artists and as actors that not only do we want to have Steve back, but to bring on Dr. Shirley to talk about this book specifically in the value and application it has to acting. So thank you both so much for being here. Thank Are you. you kidding? This is great. This is great. Well, I wanted to make sure that you you met the brains and the beauty behind my supposed genius. And here she is, <laughs> Dr. Shirley. Behind every good man, right? Well, behind every good man and especially behind me. She's really been an incredible support and has given me a lot of insight into public speaking. And I thought I knew a whole lot until I started talking to her and she has an entirely different perspective on nerves, the nervous system, why we get nervous, and how we can we can manage those nerves. So we had a radio show that was psychology meets everyday life, and one of our shows was on public speaking. And it was like that 1980s commercial, perhaps 70s, I'm not I you know, I don't have all these commercials archived, but that commercial where you know, you got my chocolate and my peanut butter. You got my peanut butter and your chocolate. I was talking about how to give speeches, and she was talking about the fear of public speaking. And it became a pretty popular show for us. And it, it occurred to us that we had never really seen any kind of resource out there that married these two ideas. There just there weren't any, and it was shocking for us, actually. And somebody was foolish or generous enough to give us a book deal and so we wrote a book on it (laughs) and it's been it's been really rewarding because again like dr shirley said look public speaking and nerves it translates way beyond just giving that official speech working a room or even auditioning Mm -hmm. we're we're all in a situation where we we feel very overwhelmed or we feel like oh my gosh this is what's happening to me right now or we're sweating or you know nerves really take over even even um socially when you know people some people can be very shy and are invited to a party and really want to go because we are programmed innately to connect with people to be relational but we're too afraid to go to the party you know and so these tips understanding the why, you know, I'm a huge left brain. So understanding the why of something always made me, you know, think, okay, now I can buy into it because now I understand the why of something. And then Steve so beautifully gives you the how how to. So you can use these tips, not just in public speaking, but in everyday life. So really getting to it, the idea is nerves are essentially good for us. They're our survival mechanism. And when we think, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous right now. That's actually a good thing. And Dr. Shirley can certainly explain it better than I can. It lets us know that we're alive. And sometimes, Hmm. you know, a little too much. (laughs) (laughs) But it kind of is what motivates us to do things. Unfortunately, when nerves are too high, it motivates us not to. And that's why we wrote the book, because we didn't want anyone to not, you know, go for that promotion or not go for the audition or um, anything else. 
or even say the eulogy, you know, when a loved one passes just because of the nerves of public speaking. Right. The most important thing that the brain is here to do is to keep us alive, to keep our species alive. And so it's all about survival. And the primitive part of the brain doesn't know the difference between a tiger coming at you or, you know, a thousand eyes looking at you when you're about to give a speech. And if that, you know, because if you get rejected from your club, you're alone in the jungle and the tiger can get you because you only have one pair of eyes looking for the tiger. Whereas when you're connected in a group, you have many pair of eyes. And that's right. truly what that's about. What that fear of public speaking is about is the fear of being laughed at, rejected, and then you're left alone. And the primitive part of the brain looks at that as, oh my God, the tiger's going to eat me. We're, we're programmed to panic, essentially. And it's that idea that when we are faced with a perceived threat, we go into that fight, flight, or freeze mode. As you know, Shirley said, it keeps us alive. It keeps us from walking down the 405 and having a picnic right in the middle. Uh, and it keeps us from walking, you know, down a dark alley. But for the primitive brain, fear is one size fits all. So like she said, you know, getting up and giving a speech feels the same as facing down a tiger. And as modern humans, we have to adapt to that. Number one, we have to say, oh, wow, this is not the same thing. <laughs> and then we have to adapt as we go. One of the cool things that Dr. Shirley likes to say is expect the expected. And Dr. Shirley, what do you mean by that? If you're someone who knows that they get nervous when public speaking or when going to an audition, then expect to get nervous. You know, telling ourselves, don't get nervous or relax or why can Johnny do it and I can't? What's wrong with me? You know, you're just kind of piling on the stress. So when you expect that to happen or even, you know, if your mom is kind of, you know, a pain in the in the backside and you're going to go for Thanksgiving dinner, then expect her to be. Don't expect her to be any different than what she already is. And that it doesn't mean that that takes away the feelings about it or the disappointment, it, but it does take away the sting. And in terms of public speaking, it takes away the added nerves that come with, oh, my God. So then you can figure out, and our book gives you many, many wonderful tools on how to reduce your anxiety. The anxiety will never go away completely, but there are very, very real tools that you can use uh, to reduce the anxiety. And the anxiety can manifest physiologically, right? So when I get nervous, my hands get cold and my mouth goes dry. For other people, their face turns beet red, or they get overheated, or their legs start shaking, or they have what I call the nervous pee. I'm a nervous peer. So, you know, I, I just want to put that out there. If people don't know enough about me now, you know, I'm a nervous peer. So when I get nervous, I think, well, gee, I need to pee right now. Maybe not, but I will try to find anything, a bathroom, a plant, you know, wherever, because, you know, I need to go. So this is something where I need to expect this expected thing and not get freaked out about it. And I, we always ask people, you know, look, when, when you do get nervous, what happens? They say, well, my face turns beet red. And then we ask them again, well, why are you so freaked out when that happens? If it happens every single time, expect the expected. I'm so glad it's the uh, the impulse to go and not just actually going, Steve, because I was a little unclear when you first said <laughs> you just get nervous and just go right there. And you're I'm like, you're yeah. sitting there uh, on this podcast right now, uh, having wet yourself. Exactly. You um, have no idea what happened three minutes before we went on the air. <laughs> and that's why this is an audio p podcast rather than a video. Exactly. Except I'm just going to just to protect that out there as well. Just protect Steve. Um, yeah. So exactly. I, I'm so glad I'm so glad we've jumped. Uh, right in and and as I said at the beginning, you know there are so many different applications to, to uh, acting and being in the audition room. And I'm just curious, because, since we don't know a lot about you, Dr. Shirley, I'm curious if you had any interest in um, I don't know the entertainment industry in general or being an actor, n not being an actor yourself, but just the 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 lifestyle of being an actor before you got into this book or got involved with this crazy guy, Steve. Well, you know. Being born and raised in L.A., yes, I've been around it for a long time. I, you know, it's a skill that I don't possess and I very much admire it. You know, sometimes people have this idea that it's, oh, it's so easy because the great actors make it look so easy. But it is not. Um, and I very much admire the craft. Um, and also, you know, there's, there's such a stigma 
that I think society in general, maybe not so much in L.A., has with actors where they have it all. You know, if you've got money, you've got people loving you all the time. And it's not that easy. So many things come with it that can be, you know, that can be a struggle. And um, I kind of work on that end with with uh, with actors. I do have quite a few in my practice. And, you know, the real people that some have been through abuse and abuse doesn't just disappear because you're an actor now and you have money and people love you. So it's 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 a very interesting dynamic. Well, one of the things that uh, I know uh, actors tend to face often is the idea of rejection. And we sort of reject the idea of rejection on the podcast because we have this belief that, that it, it's not real because you if someone says you didn't get the part, that doesn't mean that they said you can never act again. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also had a really great uh, guest on recently by the name of Michael Kostroff, who said something that we have repeated on almost every episode since, which is statistically, you're not getting the fucking part. So let that go. And so we were really taken by some of these sort of uh, almost, you know, NLP, like neuro linguistic programming things in the book that could lend themselves really well to going into an audition, for instance, uh, the power stance. So I'm getting into, I guess, some of the tools that you present to support one with their nerves. And the power stance is a great one. I also love the, um, I think you call it name it to tame it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Brene Brown talks about it in some of her work where if you just identify what it is that you're experiencing and do nothing else but identify it. Don't judge it, don't try to change it, don't resist it, just identify it out loud or by naming it, uh, it can really help in these situations. And I, I can't wait for the next audition that I go to, or we sometimes refer to them as meetings on this podcast, so that I can say, oh, hey, look, I'm nervous. That must mean I care a lot or whatever before going in. Thanks to some of these these tools. What are, what are some of your other favorites in that area? Well, that's, I mean, that's the beauty kind of understanding the why, you know, in the last 20 years of um, neurobiology in the, in the brain, we've learned a lot of things. And that whole idea of, you know, stones and, uh, what is it, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is, is bullshit. Is, <laughs> you know, because words do hurt. And we need to tune into our bodies to notice what is, you know, what we're feeling. So, the, for example, the reason why uh, naming an emotion tames it, you know, is because we're focusing in and we're naming it. And that sometimes in and of itself allows it to dissipate. We're taught to, no, no, don't get angry. Don't feel angry because then you're going to be this one big angry person walking around or, you know, don't go into your anxiety. And that's just not true. If we go into it with, you know, if it's too much, of course, with support and with grounding, meaning noticing your feet on the ground and noticing where you are in the room, the reason why the power stance is so incredible is because the connection between the brain and the body 80% 80% of those lines run from the body to the brain. So when you're, when you're having a power stance, your body is communicating at an 80% strength. We're strong. We're good. We're confident. If you tell yourself, relax or be confident, that's only a 20% strength in signal. So mm-hmm. that's why body, that's why yoga is so helpful. But that's why body stances are, can do so much more for us than just telling ourselves, you know, X, Y, Z, relax, be strong. If we're nervous, the body is telling the brain, oh my God, you're in danger. And what makes us nervous going into an audition because they may say, we don't, you know, no, thanks, but no thanks, you're not right for the part. Which means in, you know, caveman days, you're being dejected, you're being rejected from that group. Now, don't try to make logical sense of it because it doesn't in the scenario, in the scenario, but that's what the primitive brain is picking up. Oh, I just got rejected. Oh, no. I'm going to go out there, be alone, and get eaten by a tiger. So nerves come before the audition because what if I get detected? That may mean I'm going to be eaten by the tiger. That's what the brain, if the brain, if the primitive part of the brain could speak, that's what it would be saying. So to ground yourself, to notice, okay, I'm in my shoes, I'm in this room. Oh, look, the room is painted white. It has pictures on the wall. When you're or- orienting yourself and grounding yourself into the here and now, you're letting the brain know, okay, no, wait a minute. We're in 2016. I'm at the CBS studios. I'm in an audition room. I'm not in the jungle, and a tiger's not going to get me. That's why grounding helps so much because it puts you in the here and now, gets you out of the primitive brain, and puts you in the here and now. And in the here and now, yeah, auditioning can be a little anxiety provoking, but it's not the point of I'm going to die. 
So, Steve, there were a few other areas that really stuck out to Trevor and myself as we were reading through this uh, that applied to a life as an actor. And we were wondering, specifically from your point of view as being some being in PR, if you maybe perhaps coach your, your clients in these areas. So you have this experience, you know, Dr. Shirley, Dr. Shirley just referred to it as the how-to, right? You have this ex experience in, in these areas and you've written a book about them in public speaking, but we have a sneaking suspicion, Trevor and I have a sneaking suspicion, you probably apply these to your clients as well. And the two main ones we wanted to talk about, there were several, but the two main ones we wanted to address were the idea of fillers, that that all that stuff you guys talk about in chapter seven of the book. And then also the very next chapter, chapter eight, the dressing the part. So let's start with the, the fillers thing. So this is like, um, like, I mean, or if you're from California, the San Fernando Valley, <laughs> Maybe right. doing the, like the up talk at the end of the sentences. Right. Right. So, so do, you, do you find yourself coaching your clients if they're going to, say, be on a morning show or a talk show in this area? Sure. It depends on who they are and how much experience they have in front of the media. But when you do media coaching, you're looking for those fillers. You're looking for those moments where people are filling in with either a verbal or non-verbal filler. And so when you speak, obviously, credibility is coming out of your mouth at the same time as words are. And to sound confident and to sound clear, you should really be careful in how many uh, fillers you use just because it can come off as an um, 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 um show rather than really communicating the message of what you're, you're there to do. To, communicate. And when it comes to what you call the, what technically it's called the high rising terminal, where you end everything like a question, it's up talk or up speak. You have to be really careful with that. Because from my experience, young women tend to do it the most. And I don't really think that young women or any women in general need to ask permission for everything. I really mm. don't. And that's what you're doing. You're asking for permission. Now, I don't think that young women believe that that's what they're doing, but it sure sounds like that to a whole lot of people, even subconsciously. As, as a young woman, as, as a woman in the business world, as a woman who is working in this industry where we know they don't make as much as the guys do, hey, stand in your power. And one of the ways you do that is physically, but also the way you communicate, the way you present yourself verbally. I, I never thought of it uh, as asking permission. That's that's huge. I, I'm sure that's going to resonate with a lot of our female listeners uh, as well. Well, there are a lot of studies about pronoun uses, especially, and they, they've looked at email and they've they've analyzed tons of of ways we communicate. One of the things that they've noticed is that when we are in, in the subservient role, say we're emailing a casting director, we'll use a lot of I statements. But the casting director's emails will use we statements. And so you can pretty much gauge where you are in the pecking order by looking at your own emails. So when you're emailing somebody as an authority figure, then you will, you will use different pronouns. Wow. So, so you'll use you, people that have a, um, a power position in the relationship will tend to use we more than I. Is that, is that right? Right. They'll, yes. They'll use the Queen's we. Wow. <laughs> there's, there's a <laughs> professor named James Pennebaker who wrote a great book called The Secret Life of Pronouns, What Our Words Say About Us. He's a professor at the University of Texas. And it's absolutely <clears throat> fascinating in how women and men use different pronouns socioeconomically. It shows us if you are rich, you'll use certain pronouns if you're in a position of power, like I said. But it, it really is is one of those things we do not think about, but does play a role in how people see us. Oh, man, that's intense. I'm going to yeah. go back and read a bunch of my sent inbox no, now. It's, it, uh. it's very <laughs> scary. It's very scary. Yeah, that is crazy. But, you know, 
it's one of these things that, like, look, you've got to be aware of what you say and how you say it. So you don't necessarily need to look at every pronoun you use. But at the same time, you should have some awareness about how you are communicating yourself, how are you you're presenting your best self. And one of the things that you wanted to ask about was clothing. And yeah, I was going to say they're, they're related, right? Because it's what our absolutely. words say about us, what our clothing, you, got, you, you both talk about what the clothing says. I'm interested to hear, in addition to Steve, what you have to say about like the way, you know, the way in which you coach your clients, if Dr. Shirley has anything to say about how it affects our psychology too, just, uh, you know, both sort of chime in on this point. Well, one of the things that, that maybe is applicable to actors, especially when you're going on a red carpet or you're, you're going to a press opportunity and you have a couple of different outfits to choose from, you try them on and, and you walk around. How do you make the decision on what you're going to wear? And what it really comes down to is what, what makes you feel most secure? What makes you feel most confident? Now, it's not always going to be going to be the case, but really, if you feel confident in what you're wearing, you're going to carry yourself differently. So that's one way you're communicating to yourself, not necessarily to the outside world. But that will translate to the outside world because people will see you as this confident, charismatic person. And clothes do communicate. Look, we, we judge people on their, their clothing every single day. And Perhaps it's subconscious at, at times, but it's it's instant, and it's it, it really affects in how we treat people. And so many studies have shown that if you are dressed well, you're going to be treated a certain way. When you walk into stores, when you fly, just walking out in the world. What I always coach my clients when it comes to clothing is, look, look like a star. Be the star. So even if the photographers have no freaking clue who you are, if you show up on that carpet and you look fantastic, believe me, they're going to take your photo and they're going to wonder who the heck is this person. And that's how you get the attention. Now, we're not talking about over the top. We're just talking about classy and star-like and looking like you belong there and, you know, really shining in that moment. So... Being a schlub on the carpet is not something that I, <laughs> I think is valuable for anybody, because especially if you are an unknown and you're you're trying to get some attention. Look, that's not the way to do it. You'll blend in, or you'll you'll present something very negative to people. Hmm. And and jumping on what Steve is saying, I really want to emphasize that we always, when we think about what we're going to wear, we always think about how are people going to perceive what we're wearing. But it is just as important, as Steve mentioned, to know how do I feel wearing this shirt or wearing this dress? Because that will that will kind of, um, you know, adjust your body language and your body language will speak volumes to the people who are, who are um, looking at you. So it's twofold. It's not, you're not just dressing for others, but you're also dressing for what makes you feel the most confident or what makes you feel the most... Uh, fluid. If you're going to an audition, you have to be fluid. You can't be kind of, you know, stuck in a box. Um, so it's so important to consider both when deciding what you're going to wear. And going back to what Dr. Shirley was talking about, the body informing the mind. Look, when you wear a suit and tie, you carry yourself in a certain kind of way. When women wear high heels, they tell me, look, I feel my body adjust to the heels so I feel taller and I feel you know much more confident but that's really the body adjusting to the the clothing thing in a certain kind of way so I think that again communicates to the brain look I got this I look good All right, guys, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed uh, part one of our chat with uh, Steve Rohr and Dr. Shirley Impelizari. So cool, man. Down the rabbit hole we go. I know, I know. I And, it, you know, it, 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 it's tough because we, we've talked about this on the show before, but it, it bears repeating on an episode like this. We get, now that we our popularity has grown a little bit, our numbers are up and, and our visibility is up, <clears throat> we get bombarded 
by people wanting to come onto the show to talk about their class, their film, their book, their product of some kind. Um, and you know, very often that's like, that is the, that is their only pitch. It's like, Hey, I want to come on and talk about X, Y, and Z. And we're like, uh, like we, we want to talk to people. We want to talk to you because you have an interesting story, because you have a lot of value to bring to our listeners, because, you know, there's so many other like intangibles besides the product. And so when we have an episode like this, it, it, it feels like, <clears throat> oh man, are we, are we doing that? Are we just talking about, are we just, you know, uh, uh, plugging a product? But here's the thing, Trevor and I both read this book. We both loved it. We both thought that it had so many applications to actors that we probably would have made it a pick of the week at some point. We may have even been fighting over it in the same week <laughs> at some point. Um, and and on top of that, Steve's one of our most popular guests in recent memory. So it, it just made a ton of sense. Um, and I'm so grateful for, for the both of them. So thank you. If you're listening, Dr. Shirley, Steve, thanks for coming back on the mm. podcast. I don't know if you yeah. have anything else you want to say. Trev, you want to leave the big big debrief for the end of the second part? I mean, I, I just I said it at the beginning, but I mean, we talk about the inner and outer game of success in the entertainment industry. This whole interview series uh, touches on both of those like quite poignantly. Mm. I mean, the inner, the inner game, your inner world creates your outer world. And like just some of the, the concepts that we, we chat about in, in these, these two parts here are just, it's all about the inner game. And, uh, you know, you can't create something on the outside until you create it on the inside. And that's what this is all about. And it's just some really great tools to do that. I mean, like when she said that 80% of your, your neurons and your energy lines and whatnot flow from your body to your brain, meaning your body 80% of the time is giving feedback to your brain about what's going on. That was like a huge, like aha for me because I'm, I'm, I'm in my head. Most of the time I walk around telling, you know, my body, how it should feel, how it should be. And just to hear that that's not very effective, <laughs> try it the other way, uh, is, is, is huge, you know, and especially for the, the audition room and those high stake situations that a lot of us, of, of, uh, artists find themselves in. I mean, what a great, you know, practice to, to put into place is calming the body so that the brain can take a chill pill as well. I, I guess I, I probably should have understood that intuitively as an athlete, but, uh, I guess some things you need to learn several times over. Yeah, well, it also reminds me of that one, the, the time that you and I went to the same sort of uh, retreat training thing, and uh, and you did the the Tom York, oh. uh, the dancing. Yeah, and, oh, I'm going to do that every single day, and I know you haven't, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> How many times have we heard the same things over and over and over on this podcast and go, oh, it's so amazing. Like, it's the first time we've heard yeah. it. You know, it's not <laughs> no. the first time we've heard it. That, that's actually, that's, that's one piece of feedback that I get from some of our listeners who say that, you know, like, I, I like the show a lot, but I start to hear a lot of the same things over and over. And part of me is like, that's the point. <laughs> You know, like I get that we always want new stimulating novel ideas, but uh, I think T. Harv Eker said the three most dangerous words in the English language are I know that because as soon as we start telling ourselves that we know something, we shut ourselves down to the possibility of growing in that area. And I think of all the times in my life that I've said like, oh, yeah, I know that. And about maybe 2% of the time was I actually living that 98% of the time. I didn't know it. I knew it intellectually, but I wasn't putting it into practice. And so hearing the same things from different people who are m m creating lots of success and, and incredible things in their lives, I think is valuable personally. I would say that the challenge for any list, I mean, I don't want to like, you know, get in some listeners. Oh, no, of course not. Like that. But I think the <laughs> challenge, I think the challenge to anybody who, whoever listens and thinks that is like, Oh, you know, yeah, I've heard, I've heard this before on the podcast, whatever it be like, okay, so that means that you've, you've got it. You're done. Like you, you have, you have that, whatever that principle is, whatever that distinction is, whatever that thing is that we've, we're talking about again, you've mastered it. That, that's what you're saying by saying like, oh, I don't, I don't necessarily want to hear this again because I've already heard it. Right. You, you, you you've mastered it <laughs> or, or have you is the question. You know, I think yeah. that's, that's the challenge yeah. is have you actually mastered that thing? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, maybe the argument could be made that like, oh, I, I have, you know, 
uh, examined that that thing, that idea, that practice, whatever, and, and decided that it doesn't apply to me. And like that's that's a totally legit thing. But it's like, is there a way that you could sort of manipulate it slightly so that it does apply to you? Because if it keeps coming up over and over in interviews with successful people there's something there, you know? I mean, that's the whole mission of the podcast is to get down to like, what are the main things that keep people in the game? Mm. What is the, what are the consistent things that show up over and over? Anyway, uh, we're off on a little bit of a tangent right now, but (laughs) it's all good. Um, why don't I go first with my pick of the week? Because yours sort of rolls in nicely with, uh, our listener pick from this week. Cool. Um, so, uh, my pick the week is a documentary, uh, called He Named Me Malala, which is based on the book I Am Malala, which is all about uh, Malala Yousafzai. Um, the book is actually, I think, her, her autobiography. Uh, maybe she had a, a sort of co-writer with her on that. But uh, this is the young woman who was in uh, Palestine um, as it was being taken over by the, by the Taliban, And she started to speak out in a country that was full of people who were terrified to do so. She started speaking out for uh, standing for women's education and was shot in the face by a Taliban member uh, for her for her efforts. Um, They made, you know, they had this this book and then they made a documentary based on the book and uh, she Jasmine, survived. She, sur- obviously. Yeah, she yeah. survived, and and Jasmine and I watched this the other day. So not only did she survive, but now she's become this massive cultural icon. Who, when asked by someone like John Stewart, or you know, she's met Bill Gates, Obama, like all these uh, huge uh, cultural icons. When asked by one of them if she, you know, hates her, her, her. Uh, attackers, you know, she she always says, you know, no, I, I I have no ill will towards them whatsoever. I don't hate them. I don't think they're bad uh, uh, people. I, I forgive them completely because I know that I wasn't attacked by a person. I was attacked by an ideology. Um, wow. And so the documentary is is fantastic. Uh, found myself inspired and and crying at times, and um, I would recommend it. Uh, to, to anyone, I, I believe it's on Netflix, uh, at least here in the U.S. Um, so uh, check that out. He named me Malala Movie dot com is the website. Dude, if that's not an evolved way to move through life, I don't know what is. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah, I've heard so many good things about that. So that's definitely on the list. It's fantastic. All right, and uh, your pick, my friend. Uh, my pick of the week is also a documentary that I recommend everybody see. I know I've I've got a little bit of a sort of sweet tooth for these um, these like food culture documentaries. I've I've shared a few of them on the show. Uh, Terra was one of my favorite uh, recent documentaries. It's about culture and how human beings relate to one another and 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 our food supply and things like that. You know, forks over knives, hungry for change. These are all, all you know Netflix documentaries. Well, this documentary came out recently. I think just last week, actually, called Food Choices. You can find them online at foodchoicesmovie.com. And what I really like about it is that, you know, not only is it feature the regular talking heads uh, in the nutrition world, uh, but it, it's, it's structured in such a way uh, that it basically takes all the most common questions or rebuttals that people have uh, against eating a largely, if not completely plant-based diet and it addresses them one by one with uh conversation and commentary and research from these various experts and you know people who've published books and doctors and people who started organizations and movements and who work in these fields and it is a a really well put together um film that i think illustrates very clearly a way forward for uh people, uh, whether it's, uh, in terms of health, whether it's in terms of, uh, performance, whether it's in terms of, uh, you know, being better stewards of the planet, whether it's in service of, you know, world peace and equality or, or climate change or, you know, anything, it really lays out a compelling argument question by question by question. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. So you can find it on iTunes. You can rent it. It's, I think I rented it for like four bucks and really, really enjoyed it. So food choices, movie.com is where you can learn more about that. Awesome. 
Um, sweet. And that segues really nicely into uh, a listener pick we got from a listener named Katie. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, of this. I actually heard of this recently because I have several friends, my mom and my sister, all um, uh, starting to buy into this uh, thing called Whole30. Uh, there is a website, which is W-H-O-L-E 30.com. Uh, so 30.com. Um, and <clears throat> my understanding, I haven't read the book yet or checked out the, the website in, in full, but my understanding is, is it's about taking 30 days to focus on eating only whole foods. So literally nothing processed, no sugar, no uh, legumes, grains, um, uh, no, uh, obviously no MSG or sulfites. Um, and the reason that Katie decided to do this is because she had just come home from a tour and her body was a mess. She let, she let, uh, the tour be an excuse for not eating well and eating right. And, uh, ever since she, she took on this challenge, she says she feels amazing, has more energy, sleeps better at night and, uh, and has a better understanding of how food makes me feel. And I think that's what, she says that's crucial for actors, and I think that's a lot of what the uh, the book actually talks about is um, how various um, foods actually affect us. So, Trevor, I you know mm, kind of surprised yeah. you kind of surprised you haven't already read this one, buddy. <laughs> no, but it is it is new, um, and uh, you can buy the book at the website. But there's also information there that's free just on their website, and then um, I guess there's even a hashtag on Twitter hashtag Whole Thirty. Mm, so. Yeah. Um, anyway, she said it's, it's tough, you know, get some friends to do it with you to have some support because it's tough, especially the first 10 days. Um, you know, so having a support system is really, uh, supportive. <laughs> um, and that goes back to a bit of like, uh, one of the, one of the five pillars, right. From Craig Ballantyne, that positive, uh, support, social yeah. support. Yeah. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. I've heard a lot about the whole 30 movement and, uh, I've looked into it a little bit. I haven't, you know, read the book or, or I don't look. I haven't looked too hard at it, but it looks great. I mean, anything that encourages people to eat closer to nature, uh, I think is a really, really good thing. And the whole 30 is all about just those, those foods that come from the ground and haven't been modified in any, or any really crazy noticeable way so that we are eating like we've long been eating for the history of our evolution. (laughs) You know, I, I wish there were less animal products in, in the, um, in the plan, but you know, baby steps, as long as people are thinking about what they're putting in their body, I'm, I'm a happy camper. Yeah. Well, so much of it is about mindfulness, right? Yeah. So, um, I think this is, this is a huge step in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that is, he named me Malala. Uh, a documentary, a very powerful documentary on Netflix, Food Choices, another great documentary. You can find it on basically all the uh, video on demand platforms and Whole30, which is both a book and a movement. Find more uh, about that at Whole30.com. And that does it then for episode 250, I think. Yes, sir. All right. Well, today's episode of Inside Acting was produced and co-hosted by me, Trevor Algott, and you, AJ Meyer. Jen Levin is our production coordinator. Gadali Gubrek is our marketing and web director. Deborah Smith is our community manager. Timothy Patrick Waterman is our director of public relations. Trevor Algott edited and mixed today's episode and composed our theme and interview music. And Fern Lim designed our logo. You can sign up for our weekly email dispatch and listen to all of our episodes at our website, InsideActing.net. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. One of these days, I'm not going to be able to get through that list in one breath. And if you do nothing else, a favorable review on iTunes goes a long, long way because it's kind of like putting a little tip in our tip jar because it helps other people discover the show as well special thanks to our sponsors rehearsal pro and vo to gogo.com and a special thanks to you guys our listeners you're listening right now and we love you for it and if you dig this show and you want to maximize its value in your life and career and you want to support it you want it to stick around and keep happening uh two great ways that you can support it uh number one sign up as a member get cool perks like access to our private member community uh invites to exclusive member meetups you get fun freebies special bonus content and a bunch of other stuff that we're working on uh that's seven dollars a month 
So it's great because we can sort of start to budget for things and build out the team. So having that recurring income is huge for the, the operation of the podcast and, and that support is, goes a long, long way. Uh, if that's not your thing, a one-time donation in any amount that you choose uh, is also greatly appreciated. Head over to insideacting.net slash contribute to, I don't know, suggest a donation of a dollar per episode would be great. If you dug this episode, kicking us a dollar uh, helps a lot. And if you'd like to go the extra mile and become a member, go to insideacting.net and click on the membership tab to get started. And that is it for episode 250 of Inside Acting. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, set yourself free. Set yourself free.